we will see in the 10 or 20 years one Bitcoin being worth $10 million. You learn that 2% inflation is good. Well, that's just bullshit. There should not be inflation. Deflation is actually great. 50% of the world problems are basically caused by a few holding on to the money uh, printer. It shouldn't be that hard. It's made that hard because central banks were set up and they took over the biggest monopoly in the world called money creation. People can now hardly afford buying a house. It's terrible, but it's man-made. It's created by this system, this unfair system. Bitcoin brings the system back to even keel and fair. You end up in a citadel or you end up in a renaissance where uh, things are good, fair and equal. The hardest money always wins. People and money will always go to where they're treated best. In the ECB, they are scared shitless. And if you are scared shitless and your biggest profit-making scheme ever invented is now under duress, what do you do? You you kick and you scream. And uh, that's what we see uh, Lagarde do. I found the hardest money ever. And you put some money into it. It will go up forever. It's mathematically programmed to go up forever. And it will. It brings back the power to the person. It's not just abundance in wealth or in money, but abundance in ideas, abundance in time, abundance in uh, sharing love, creating uh, stuff. Before we get into Bitcoin, uh, really briefly, what are you doing? I think you had uh, you founded, co-founded Amsterdam Capital Manager, Man when I remember that correctly. Yes, that's right. So basically, there's two two things. Basically, I am Bitcoin OG, which I first came across in 2013. So a uh, long time. I'm uh, still uh, waiting for my Mount Cox uh, money to come back, if ever. Yeah, and ups and downs, of course. You know, we've had three times going down uh, in the cycle, uh, 70 80%. So you really have to, uh, you know, it's the school of hard knocks. Um, and so that's my um, one passion or, or, or activity. And the other one is, is Amsterdam Capital Management, which is uh, equity research. Uh, so we do research of uh, share markets, different share markets for clients. And uh, they buy it mainly in a subscription form. So that can be family offices, wealth funds, high net worth individuals. And we have our own quant model to... Uh, Look for those companies that are improving. And so basically, uh, yeah, we buy those and stay away from the companies that are deteriorating. And that's worked really well. So I've been doing that with a few partners now for 10 years. Yeah, for instance, the longest running product is, is a Dutch one. Uh, so the Dutch stock market in there, we've been compounding at 18.3% per year, which is very high and let's say 5 to 10% higher than, uh, than the stock market. So, uh, and that also brings me back to, let's say, my sort of overall background, which is financial. So I've always been in the financial world. I used to be in corporate finance, uh, mergers and acquisitions, buying and selling uh, companies, both here in Amsterdam, but also I went to do that for 14 years in New Zealand. So, um, uh, yeah, have seen lots of different things and lots of different companies. And when you sell a company, you sort of get to see the inside and what makes it tick and uh, how different business models work and how different companies, uh, you know, make their, uh, make their money. Uh, so that's helped me with the, with the equity uh, research. Interesting. Uh, uh, just briefly, what is quant? I never heard that. Quant comes from quantitative and it basically means using a lot of data information. And you also, the opposite would be qualitative. So, you know, to make it really simple, if you keep it in the sort of equity in the share market stuff, like a quant basically uses financial data, which is normally sort of historical data. And if it's qualitative, it means you go and, for instance, talk to the CEO or go and visit the company and come up with, you know, your own feeling of whether, uh, you know, the CEO is going to build out the company or, or other stuff. But we are pure quants, so we basically use uh, all the sort of information that is in the financial statements. So if you, every company, uh, and I don't know if you want to talk about MCM Capital Management because I can talk about it uh, a lot. <laughs> so yeah, you stop me if, uh, if it's too much about that. But uh, so we use financial statements as our raw ingredients 
and they become liquid nowadays. So you can just, uh, you know, uh, use AI or other stuff to go through financial statements like an annual report or quarterly reports. And so you can look for all sorts of stuff in there, you know, correlations, signals, as we call it. And so um, that's what we do. And with the technical world word, it's called bottom-up fundamental analysis, which basically means we really look at the company, its financials, and pull that out of each other and really look for stuff like in the, in the cash flow, in the balance sheet, in the profit and loss. And we have got like 90 signals that tell us whether a company is uh, improving. And so if you have quite a few companies that improve, then slowly but surely uh, you outperform uh, the index. And uh, so although our information is based on the past, it sort of throws a shadow into the future because a company that is improving can't stop improving overnight. So it normally goes on for two to three quarters, so six to nine months. So if you've got a lot of improving companies, uh, then uh, yeah, slowly but surely you uh, you outperform the index. And not every year, but on average over an economic cycle, which is between four to six years. So uh, yeah, so back to your question. So yeah, Bitcoin on the one side, uh, our big passion, and then the luxury of having a algorithm or a quant model that actually works because uh, people in the stock market will tell you it's very, very hard to, you know, make a good performance. 95% of the investors, including everybody on Wall Street, cannot outperform a stock index. So it's, it's usually a, uh, a very tough environment. So, yeah, blessed and, and lucky and happy that we, uh, we have got a system that, uh, that does that. And also what comes with a system because people mainly lose money in the stock market because of psychological uh, traps like you know you uh, buy when things look you know going up then people go oh then I need some of that I'll buy some of it but that's the moment you shouldn't be buying uh, and then if the, the whole thing crashes then you would typically want to sell because you don't want to be associated with something that's crashing and that again is another psychological trap so if you have a system then you don't fall into all those traps. So that's the sort of second thing that also really helps uh, us and our clients because the system just says to companies, they're now no longer outperform as it's called, a good company. It's now a neutral or a underperform and we just sell it without looking at any psychological uh, stuff. So uh, that helps and that helps our clients as well because they can uh, sleep at night, uh, you know, knowing that the system is taking care of it. Really, really cool. Um, which brings me kind of to my next question. Um, it sounds like you come really from the traditional financial space. How did you get Bitcoin so early? And <laughs> usually it's like cypherpunks and, 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 and those things. Like, how did you get Bitcoin in, in 2013 with your background? Yeah, well, that's where, that's where I like to give myself a compliment. But I mean, you should always be careful when you start complimenting yourself. But it was, so I wasn't sort of mining. I wasn't a techie that was mining. And just as a side uh, offshoot, uh, you know, I started accumulating Bitcoin. No, I really did discover it. So uh, I read the Wired magazine. And actually, our biggest hero, Max Kaiser, I came across him, I think, in 2011. And it was one of those things where you read about it and then you sort of looked stuff up. But in 2011, it was very, very difficult to, you know, you know, uh, set up a wallet or whatever. Yeah. So that was, so then that stopped. But then back in 2013, I uh, read this Wired magazine uh, article and I've always been someone that likes to solve puzzles, you know, um, left brain, right brain, what is it, you know, looking for the odd things and uh, always want to solve equations. And this was like the perfect equation, perfect, uh, you know, absolute scarcity being uh, discovered in the universe ever. And so it, it grew from there. And obviously, you know, you need to do, what is it, 500 hours before you really get it. So, I mean, I didn't obviously get it straight away, but it, it did really connect and click. And it was both that absolute scarcity was invented, which is, you know, as big as the number zero or as bigger than, uh, than uh, anything we've seen in the universe. And that together for also for the first time that state and money could be separated 
And obviously, being a student of economics, I studied economics, I've always been disappointed with everything we've had to learn. I remember me sitting in university having to learn all sorts of stuff, including the efficient market hypothesis and whatever, a supply and demand curve, which are like two static lines trying to explain a dynamic environment. So a lot of resistance was built up in me and I knew a lot of things were not right. Just like inflation, which, you know, you learn that 2% inflation is good. Well, that's just bullshit. You know, there should not be inflation. Uh, and deflation is actually great. The Price of Tomorrow, Jeff Books, Jeff uh, Booth's book is brilliant, brilliant in, in explaining that. But that will never be explained to you in, uh, in, in you know, university uh, about economics. So uh, Bitcoin also helped me to uh, resolve all those things that I knew were not sitting well. And um, yeah, so it sort of came from there. And uh, then you go down the rabbit hole and the rabbit hole goes deeper and deeper and still, you know, uh, is going uh, going on. So it was wonderful. It's like uh, you come for the money, stay for the revolution. Uh, you come for solving puzzles, but you stay because you can become a sovereign individual or a, uh, you know, uh, problems. Maybe 50% of the world problems are basically caused by a few holding on to the money uh, printer if that can be taken out of their hands uh, and we can go back to uh, the, the Byzantium Empire, for instance, of a few hundred years where the gold was the standard, something that could not be manipulated only by maybe 2% if you dig, uh, dig deeper and faster. But uh, so now, yeah, this was also leading to, you know, a uh, perfect uh, economy and uh, uh, let's say if you talk about uh, economics like Keynes and um, uh, all the other schools, basically the one that, that, that comes closest to all of this is, of course, the Austrian school. Where uh, uh, So it's sort of glove in hand and it's, it, it, it became more and more interesting. And then you meet different people and then the market starts developing. Uh, then you see different products uh, developing. Then you see the base layer and the, the lightning layer being built on top of it. So basically, yeah, if you look at money, it's uh, sort of got the three properties, right? Uh, unit of account, medium of exchange, and the store of value. The store of value by far is the most important one. And the store of value sort of comes first. And the other is medium of exchange or unit of account can come after that, but don't have to. Uh, and so if all we would do with Bitcoin is create the perfect medium, uh, sorry, store of value, then already, I mean, you can think of um, uh, living in, uh, in, well, not paradise, but places where war can no longer be financed, where people can basically save their toil, their, their hard earned stuff uh, over time and over space. And everything that money was supposed to solve, which is nothing more than sort of oil or a lubricant, um, is then taken out of the hands of those that want to manipulate and control it. And it can just be what it needs to be, uh, being a lubricant to uh, allow uh, interaction and trade and uh, people to uh, to grow um, and, and, and also save their hard work toil, which if you look at the economy today, you cannot save. And this gives unrest. I mean, uh, a piece of cheese in, in, in Holland uh, used to be uh, six euros, then it was eight euros, now it's 12 euros, now I think it's 14 euros. People cannot afford it. So all those problems are being solved as well by this huge invention. Absolutely. Yeah, it's, 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 it's massive. Uh, you also ma already mentioned uh, some of the implications uh, of having now with Bitcoin absolute scarcity. What is for you the, the biggest implication uh, on, on a global scale when more people, not just like a small <laughs> group that we are now uh, that have Bitcoin or actually understand Bitcoin, but when like a majority of the world actually gets Bitcoin and has Bitcoin, what do you think is one of the, the, the biggest implications of having the Bitcoin, having some money, having absolute scarcity? Well, basically you can take away nearly all of the problems that come comes with rogue money 
and replace it with something that is um, near perfect. But I mean, it, all it does, it, it functions as, you know, allowing uh, your hard work to be put into something temporarily called, you know, saving or that you can transact with uh, someone else. So that uh, basically it shouldn't be that hard. It's made that hard because, you know, central banks were set up and they basically took over the biggest monopoly in the world called money creation. But now it would go back to the people. So huge amount of positive implications. All the unbanked can become banked. All the people that are now being stolen from by inflation will no longer be stolen from but will also start living uh, a different life. If money is hard, which this is the hardest money ever invented, it means that investments will get uh, back to the definition that what it should always be. You know, if you want to invest something, you need to know for the next few generations that the money is hard and it will not melt away or like, a, a, like an ice cube, uh, you know. Uh, and also things like, we now have to work so much harder. I think it was only 60 years ago that, uh, let's say, the man uh, of the family had to work, I think, a few days in the week. He could then afford a house. He could afford a family with two children, and they would all live uh, comfortably. Now uh, the man has to work, the woman has to work, the kids some, sometimes also have to work, and all you get in return is, is empty calories and, and you can't even, uh, you know, make do. People can now hardly afford buying a house. Let's say the younger generation are basically locked out of ever buying a house. It's terrible, but it's, it's, it's man-made. It's created by this system, this unfair system. And Bitcoin brings the system back to even keel and fair. And it's never been this way. Let's say uh, Hayek and Formesis, that's, that's what they were dreaming of. A, a human action, uh, you know, the incentive comes from the person and a person, if a person works hard, he can then accum accumulate toil or savings. And that's the, 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 the incentive that needs to be in every economy, but you don't want it with, with, with rogue instruments. So the rogue instruments have been removed. Uh, efficiency can take place. You can come to close to, you know, complete uh, zero inefficiency because, you know, it costs nothing to uh, over space and time to uh, uh, put your uh, Bitcoin or your Satoshis over the Lightning Network. Everyone uh, can um, be part of it. You know, you cannot be excluded like what we live in now. You know, now it's a club and we're not in it. You know, uh, there's only a few that are in it. Now everybody can choose to be in it, but you're not forced to. And it puts everybody on an even queue. And if you know that you can now save for your children uh, and your grandchildren, uh, the world will change uh, and you will, your life will change. And so, yeah, that's the revolution. Uh, that, that, that's amazing. It, it's it's kind of like we're entering a new financial epoch, like something uh, completely different than we were in the last hundreds of years. Uh, it's like we're right at the start of, of uh, a new epoch, a new uh, a time <laughs> frame even. like there, there's, Do you also subscribe to the time chain, <laughs> time chain aspect that maybe is uh, Bitcoin even like beyond just being money, actually like uh, Bitcoin having an imp implication of how we uh, account for time and events in, in history? Yes like high time preference and low time preference. Uh, and that is key. So at the moment, we are just uh, rats running around in our uh, little rat cage and having to, you know, uh, keep running faster because inflation is stealing it away from us. Uh, but if you go back to the Renaissance, uh, then, you know, time was not so important. And the most beautiful things could be created. And, and that is what will come back. It's already coming back. I mean, basically, uh, I live on the Bitcoin standard and, you know, you, your time preference changes and you start thinking in uh, 10, 20, 100, 200, 300 years as it, as it should be because nothing works well if you're just in a materialistic world 
where you are uh, living from hand to mouth or from day to day. Uh, and that will all stop. So you know you can trust the money. You know it will always be there. Uh, you know uh, nobody can ever take it off you. You know it can never be corrupted. It can never be uh, conjured or, or, or pulled together by a group. So basically... All that is, has been resolved and all you then need to do is decide how hard or not so hard you want to work. People will keep, some people will keep working hard, some people will work less. But I mean, you know that everything you do will be conserved into the future. And that has never happened before. It happened a little bit under the gold standard, which was far superior to, to the shit we're living in today. But this is ultra, this has never happened before. Um, and then you come into things like deflation and inflation. So basically, Bitcoin is deflationary. But deflation is the most beautiful thing that there's ever happened because you can explain it very, very simple. You know, technological innovation allows us to produce more than, than we could yesterday, like the combine harvester or the AI or a computer chip. So because of man's um, uh, knowledge and improving knowledge the pancake if you would or the cake grows every year by around two percent and now because technological innovation might be even speeding up with ai it could be three percent so everyone should actually pay two to three percent less for their cheese or for their iphone or for whatever else all day every day but that's not happening because inflation is stealing it away. They're printing, printing money up, which then surpasses the deflation and then goes into inflation. But if there was no money printer and there was just a 21 million bitcoins, um, then that would be, you know, uh, there would be a slow deflation, which basically means everybody gets rich, richer, partially by their own toil, but partially just because the... The humankind has technological innovation, which is used for everyone. I mean, the combine harvester replaced 500 labor workers or field workers. So you end up in a, in a, in a, in a citadel or you end up in a renaissance where uh, things are good, fair and, and equal. So, uh, yeah, I can't wait. It's, it's fascinating when we think about the implications of that because it's so different. It, 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 it's such a huge thing. Um, when we think about that Bitcoin standard, that Bitcoin Renaissance, the Bitcoin world that, that we, we are entering now, what do you think is kind of an unexpected outcome, uh, that, that you think of that, that people or Bitcoiners maybe not have on, on their radar? What, what do you think will be something unexpected there? Well, the fight is on, obviously. You know, first they laugh at you, then they uh, ridicule you, uh, then they fight you, and then we win. Now they're fighting us. There was just an article, I think, the last two days in the ECB, uh, ECB Bank, uh, European Central Bank, saying that how unfair it is for people that came early to Bitcoin and it should not, you know, that they're getting a free ride or something. It's a bit like saying somebody that discovered Van Gogh or Rembrandt uh, early is a criminal. So, so they're on their last sort of arguments now, trying to, you know, cre create a situation where the, the people will try and uh, go against Bitcoin. But so, yeah, so, I mean, there'll be huge fights uh, still going on, but we're now at the last stage. So, uh, of uh, countries adopting, of central banks adopting, uh, two president, uh, presidential candidates in America have now said they want it. So, so yeah, I mean, what will be surprising is, I guess, the amount of fights that still have to take place. But on the other hand, I think it will go very quickly. And one of the least uh, mentioned things, I think, in that is, let's say, game theory. All this is about game theory. And game theory just says that if, if you know, uh, let's say a country, uh, Holland, treats people with Bitcoin badly and taxes them and makes their life hard. And uh, then people vote with their feet and go to El Salvador or go somewhere else. So the powers that be will obviously do everything to try and uh, block it and stop it. And that's what they're calling it, uh, you know, uh, red poison square on and on it goes. 
but there's no use. They can try, but there's no use because, you know, it's just like a water mattress. If you push on one side, uh, it goes up on the other side. That's what people do. People can vote with their feet and now they can vote with their, with their money, with their, uh, energy. And there's no stopping it. So there's not, even if all the governments in the world would sort of hold hands and try and, you know, control it, um, even then that would not uh, work. I mean, you couldn't stop the, the alcohol ban in America. You cannot stop certain things. It's a bit like weed. I mean, it's like somebody gets the assignment to kill all the weed in the world. Well, you can't. It's, so that's where we are. And game theory makes it uh, hugely dynamic and hugely interesting because it could be Qatar, it could be Kuwait, it could be uh, uh, Russia uh, mining, but also adopting and also putting it on, on their uh, central bank uh, ledger. And, you know, as soon as Kuwait would, for instance, say, well, we have uh, now adopted Bitcoin uh, as our central reserve, then it automatically, you know, means that every man and his dog, every other country needs to also think about it because only the first five cabs of the rank can get ahead and the rest will have to, you know, spend their life trying to catch up where you cannot catch up, just like another company cannot really now catch up with uh, micro strategy, you know, 200,000, uh, 250,000 bitcoins, too hard to accumulate. So that's game theory. And this game theory is, is so dynamic and so powerful on a country level, on a central bank level, on a company level, on an individual level. And we're sort of now getting into, yeah, the big stages, you know, where the big blocks are falling. So, yeah, I think it will fall faster than we uh, we think. And let's say there's sort of like three apostles that sort of steer Bitcoin, keep it on track. And one is game theory. And one is, let's say, network effect. And network effect is why, you know, a company like uh, Apple or Amazon is so hard to out root because, you know, once everyone uses it, everyone uses it. But there is no product more powerful ever in the world than having one world currency. If you just have one currency and there is no uh, friction and everyone can use it and nobody can uh, be excluded, uh, then you have got the most powerful network effect. And so that's now coming together. And then the other third sort of apostle I would call path dependency. You know, it's a divine, uh, it came at the right time uh, and it came small and uh, understated, just like in uh, Hayek's or Van books, you know, a, a sly and roundabout way to disrupt the current central bank system. Um, and so, yeah, there cannot be a Bitcoin 2.0 or another coin, whatever. It doesn't matter. It will just be this. But it's a force for the good. It's a force for, for, for humanity. I partnered up with Coin Vigilante. This is the most beautiful Bitcoin timepiece that I ever saw created by anyone. Look at that beauty. I love it so much. Coin Vigilante made a perfect Bitcoin watch. That's the perfect, subtle, elegant way to go out there and show that you are a Bitcoiner. And that watch brand is Bitcoin only. And Coin Vigilante just dropped a completely new and amazing Genesis edition of their watch collections. You have the date of the first ever mined Bitcoin block in there and of course also the block height and which epoch we are currently in. I love the level of detail they put in in this masterpiece and make sure to check out those amazing Coin Vigilante timepieces down in the descriptions. I love those watches so so much. If you watch or listen to my podcast on a regular basis I guess you already bought some Bitcoin and now the most important step is is to keep the Bitcoin, keep them secure in a hardware wallet. My personal recommendation for hardware wallet is the Bitbox. It's super secure. It's simple to set up. It's also a perfect gift for a friend who has still the Bitcoin on an exchange. And you can get a 5% discount with the code Robin at the checkout. Visit bitbox.swiss Robin to get your Bitbox. And the next step is to really level up your sovereignty as an individual. You have to have 
have the most secure self-custody setup. You have to secure your own devices. You have to protect your privacy. You have to set up an inheritance plan. And depending on where you live, you even want to have a plan B, a citizenship where you can move in case something goes really, really wrong. And through all those steps, the Bitcoin way is guiding you through step by step. And if you visit the bitcoinway.com slash partners slash Robin, you even get a 30 minute free call to find out how you can level up your sovereignty. That's super interesting. I also love the breakdown with, with the those free uh, stools with the free pillows. Uh, really, really cool. Um, the first one is right now, I feel like the most uh, exciting one, the game theory aspect. We have on the one side America, where both parties kind of agree on Bitcoin. A Trump administration, uh, I guess, a little bit more than than Harris, but Harris also uh, got got more friendly <laughs> because of Trump <laughs> uh, around Bitcoin. Uh, then we have the EU and the ECP saying like, "Oh, yeah, it's unfair and stuff like that." Uh, but at the same time, there's Mika coming out. There's a lot of regulations coming out with, with Bitcoin. Uh, so they are recognizing it, uh, definitely. Uh, but I still get, I actually like just two or three days ago, yeah, two days ago, uh, I had a meeting with, uh, far, uh, far family, uh, two older people, um, to, uh, wanted to get into Bitcoin and they're like, Hey, is, is it even safe? Will it be banned and stuff like that? So, so it's still in uh, people's mind. Uh, it's still something that people think about it. I like, I have every day a Bitcoin podcast. I, I mean, <laughs> such a bullish uh, echo yeah. chamber that like the, this thought is not even in my mind. No but, escaping but people for you. Think about it. What? Sorry. I said no escaping for, for you. You're being inundated every day. <laughs> yes. It's, the most knowledgeable Bitcoin person around, uh, I would say, yes. Uh, 10,000 uh, hours probably uh, people have been bashing your head about how perfect Bitcoin is. That, that's true. It's like now f almost 300 episodes. Uh, I think that someone in Amsterdam actually said it to me that uh, when when I actually do it for 10 years and I, my plan is to do it now, what I do did for now 11 months, actually like in three days, it will be exactly 11 months that I do it. Uh, when I do that for 10 years, I've probably been the not most knowledgeable person in Bitcoin. Right now, I'm not that at all. Like I am far away from that. There's so many uh, more smart people uh, in, in, in the in the Bitcoin split. But for me, the, the, the thing that I wanted to get back to is the game theory aspect. W what do you think currently is the, the, the status of, of game theory with the ECP being uh, more aggressive against it, but then America uh, being really friendly to it and trying to get it. But then there's also like the small states like Bhutan and Salvador that are extremely pro Bitcoin. Well, they're scared now. Let's say my best estimate is maybe like three years ago, Wall Street finally got it. And it's logical because if you've got a good thing going, if you control the central bank and if you control the money supply, why would you go and disrupt? Why would you go and look at a little, small little disruptive thing? You know, why would you? Uh, so they didn't care. They didn't do the homework. If you don't put the 50 hours into Bitcoin, you're not going to get it. It's, you know, it's, it, it, you need to put it in. So. Only three years ago, uh, Larry Fink and uh, Jamie Dimon, who still calls it a pet rock or whatever, although he's now positive. I mean, with all these people, you see the 180 degrees, 180 degrees shift. First seven years or whatever, they poo-poo it. And uh, only Warren Buffett is still poo-pooing it. But I mean, yeah, I guess his time has, has been. But then, and that's the game theory in play, they, they make the 180 degrees and it's it's not that they're trying to be the smartest boy in the class. It's it's the forces that of game theory that forces it. So the clients of uh, BlackRock are asking Larry Fink, "What's your Bitcoin strategy? I want to have some Bitcoin. Why where why can't I?" So I mean, it comes from from everywhere those forces. And then um, yeah, and then he starts doing the work, or he, one of his smart smartest analysts uh, gets sent out and has to uh, find out. Is Bitcoin for real? How can we break it? Can we ever control it? Can we ever take it over? What's what's this? And then they come to the answers that they can't control it, maybe a little bit in the fringe, uh, but it is for real. It's a divine uh, intervention, basically. It's perfect scarcity. 
it's the perfect asset class ever uh, conceived. And uh, the coin starts dropping and, and they do the 180. And now uh, he's singing all the praises uh, of Bitcoin and, and he has to uh, because it's survival. And uh, then everybody else joins, uh, 11 ETFs uh, join and uh, everybody jumping over each other. And so so that's what we, we see. And that's just in three years time, I think, uh, truly that, you know, because we have a couple of funds, we have, you know, I've, I've got someone, my partner who comes out of the, uh, the London and, and the Wall Street uh, scene, who uh, normally manages, let's say, $7 billion. But so I've seen it up close how uh, people there privately had some Bitcoin, but the official story was you did not uh, have Bitcoin. And then some of them started doing deep dives and started seeing it. And you always had the rogues, uh, you know, people that starting up funds in Bitcoin. But the, the great majority did not see it or want to see it or have to see it because their paycheck was not dependent on it. But now, you know, Larry Fink says it, everybody pays uh, notices it and uh, and then game theory makes everybody do the 180 so that's just the 180 financial bigwigs but it happens with everything and so it's also happening with the the ECB uh, so I've had a few meetings with uh, some some bigwigs from uh, let's say the the Dutch ECB or previous uh, in previous times you know they are now with pension so they can now they can now speak their mind and they are going through the same journey and they are also now seeing uh, that yeah, you can't stop it. It's immutable. It's uh, unconfiscatable. It's uh, so. And then they have got even more baggage to unpack and get rid of. I just had what was it? Six years of university economics. So six years of of getting fed the wrong information. But if you're a professor of economics or you were at this in central bank. You've had 40 years or whatever of uh, Keynes and uh, monetarists and all this sort of stuff, which basically facilitates government. You know, it doesn't facilitate the people. So you need to all unravel that and unpack it and, 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 and go back to first principles. And, uh, you know, um, initiative for, drives uh, human action. And so what's this all about and then and and so they are on their journey now uh, of finding out and so the smart ones will and so uh bukele is smart was smart there'll be central bankers that are smart i think there is a few that that that, that we might know and uh then if, if one you know at some stage they'll do it secretly first but next will be that they officially put it on their uh, on the ledger as a, as, as a reserve and it will be game theory all over again, and we'll see green uh, green candles, uh, and uh, on it goes. The 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 omega candle, <laughs> the omega candle. And what's also because we're talking about the sort of three apostles, but let's say the two other. Because I once read, read read a wrote a condensed Bitcoin business plan, and it was just these sort of five sentences. So the two biggest drivers are basically people and money go to where they're treated best right that's voting with your feet uh, so that is the bitcoin citadels and the other rule or driver is hardest money always wins you know we saw it with rocks and pebbles and uh, copper and bronze and uh, gold and silver and you know the lost age of china 100 years they were on the silver standard they're now talking over the lost century because the West had gold, harder money. So the hardest money always wins. People and money will always go to where they're treated best. Those are the two dynamic forces that, that power this ahead. And then those three apostles, like network effect, game theory, and divine intervention, just like a rocket, keep it on track. And uh, so we, all, we only need to wait. Uh, it can take long or it can go fast. I think it will go fast. And uh, yeah, a new era will be born. Absolutely. Do, do you think that the ECP gets that already? Or, or, or are they still at the point where they think they can actually damage it? They think they can, 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 uh, they can still talk it, bad talk it. But game theory stops that. And let's say the, the, the ECB people that have left the ECB 
are now already understanding it and thinking about it and playing with it and coming are are also orange pilled uh, and um, and in the ECB they are scared shitless basically and if you are scared shitless and your um, biggest profit making scheme ever invented ever is now under duress. What do you do? You you kick and you scream, and uh, that's what we see uh, Lagarde do, and uh, call it bad names. But I mean, all this will be the same for everyone else. I mean, 180 degrees. We saw Larry Fink do it. You know, Jamie Dimon did do it. So, if one or two or three central, well, just need one central bank to adopt it. Call it the Russian central bank, just to throw in the geopolitical political stuff. It will be like a cardiac arrest. It will be a, a heart attack. It will be, we we need to get with it or, or we're out. I mean, they do understand game theory. And now you've got game theory, which is maybe the most powerful uh, instrument in town, together with the most divine, most scarce uh, ever invented in the galaxy uh, uh, unit called, called Bitcoin. So these two are... Uh, Hugely powerful, and 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 they and they will uh, they will react. So uh, yeah, uh, and I, I'm afraid ECB will react last. There will always be com- countries that won't, and will you know uh, incentive drives human action. I mean, uh, I guess the Lagarde is not really you know her salary is not really uh, going to go down if she doesn't adopt. But El Salvador or Paraguay or Argentina or small countries with people having huge remittance issues, you know it. They will. They will go first, and uh, yeah, that's all you need. Because then you have game theory. It's 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 happening. What, what do you think will will happen uh, to the global um, power metric once uh, there are the countries that actually get it and they adopt it early, and then there are those countries or even like European Union. Uh, a lot of countries are in there where they don't uh, adopt it because the EU says or the ECP says like, oh, we, we, we don't want to touch that. And they're actually last of the, of the bunch. And maybe America adopts it first. Maybe even like the BRICS maybe adopt it first. Let's see. Mm. Uh, like what, what, what happens on a, on a global scale or on nation states is, is that, uh, kind of the, the shift of the power that, that we are kind of seeing in, in real time? Absolutely. Like we were talking about the lost century of China, 100 years on the silver standard and the West was 100 years on the gold standard. But that's one of the biggest reasons why the West was the West and West was so powerful and could, could dominate the world. And the same will happen uh, here. You know, those that don't um, adapt, uh, adopt the Bitcoin uh, will stay behind. So it's a bit like a swamp. Bitcoin, uh, you pay the price you deserve. So if the ECB or Europe says, well, you know, we'll do without Bitcoin, thank you very much. We will do our own uh, central bank digital currency or whatever. Uh, smart people will have voted with their feet. They've gone to El Salvador, other countries. Uh, the hardest money in the world has left uh, the station. You know, Europe without any Bitcoins, Bitcoins residing in El Salvador and America or whatever else the country has adopted it. And that's the hardest money. So you get the smartest people, the hardest money, um, and it solves itself. You don't, it's, it's the peaceful revolution. And if you now look at El Salvador, GDP up, they're going to pay off the IMF and the World Bank 2013. Uh, huge positive net migration, huge positive net migration of the smartest people in the world. So it's like, you know, it's the playbook of re- Renaissance. And there's only a few, you know, that can be first. And the first ones get the spoils, most of the spoils. The rest will also get stuff, but the ones behind, unfortunately, will be Europe, I guess. Yeah, they, you know, you get the, you pay the price that you deserve. And uh, if in 20 years Europe finally does a 180 degree, it will be an impoverished uh, landmass, unfortunately. You know, the, the wealth will have gone. And that's, so hopefully they wake up, but we don't know. But that's that's on them. So yeah, I hope so. Uh, it's actually fascinating for me. Just in Germany, I see uh, two of the I don't know biggest guys uh, or girls uh, actually left uh, country for El Salvador. There's Lena Seiche with the little hodler. Uh, I mean, she has been moving around a lot even before she moved to El Salvador. But now she's in El Salvador and she is originally from Germany. Then there's Mark from the Bitcoin Hotel uh, in Blochingen. He is really 
uh, well known in, in, in Germany. And there are a bunch of smaller ones, like a bunch of uh, smaller accounts and, and people that I know of that just left uh, for El Salvador. There's like a group of like uh, eight people uh, that I know, uh, just just me. I, I don't even live in Germany. <laughs> Mm -hmm. uh, that, that that left Germany for El Salvador and they moved there uh, and there are so many more that moved to other places and stuff like that so like the the the, the brain train uh, is just starting but it's already seen and, and then I remember uh, in Venezuela like one third of the country left <laughs> the, the, like one third that's a yeah. huge amount and that's probably the, the upper third of the country that left not the, the, the lower third like uh, th those things have massive implication, as you already said, and I think I think almost nobody is ready <laughs> to see what's happening in the next like a uh, few decades when when Bitcoin uh, takes over. I'm, I'm really looking forward to that. That's why um, I always say like this podcast will run out at some point because Bitcoin will be boring because it's just like everyone uses it. But I think the time till it becomes boring will be extremely exciting. <laughs> it's still so long, you know, you get the so new uh, sovereignty, you know, the individuals become sovereign. You can cross borders with 12 words in your head. Never before ever has that been possible. You know, if you look at the energy, it basically solves climate change, which I don't believe in anyway, but I mean, it uses up the stranded energy, all the energy that goes to waste now. So it's, it's, it's pure good. Uh, so there'll be so many more stories. I mean, they put the spiritual angle as well, you know, the philosophy, philosophy about it. Uh, it's the rabbit holes get bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. So uh, I think you, your podcast is good for, for another five or 10 years, uh, you know, <laughs> I also think so. Uh, I mean, uh, that's kind of my, uh, even one year before I started the podcast, I was uh, having that slogan of like, I will not shut up, shut up about Bitcoin till it's boring, till it's the standard. Uh, let's see how, how long it goes. But uh, if, if Bitcoin is boring, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm glad I don't need to put a podcast. <laughs> that's right. But, and it's one of the sort of uh, universal rules, you know, to have a successful life is basically follow your passion and follow it until it is no longer your passion. You know, it's your, um, my passion, both Bitcoin and we follow it and we are happy. We enjoy it. We are inquisitive and we're finding out more. And if you follow your passion, uh, yeah, you, you will be, uh, you will also be rewarded for it because you add value, you know, you, you're doing stuff you love. And uh, we also get rewarded for it. We help other people create awareness. Uh, but at the same time, you know, if you find that have found the hardest money ever and you put some money in to it, it will go up forever. It's mathematically programmed to go up forever and it will. So uh, we get rewarded for it as well. So, uh, yeah. I think it goes full circle, and uh, and that we're doing uh, doing we're doing good stuff. But we're going to say we're going to do God's work. That's what Jamie Dimon said. So I'm not going to say that. That's uh, that's going far too far. That's you know you need to have a huge ego to say something like that. <laughs> <laughs> that's true. Um, uh, what is this? Uh, because we, you mentioned it. What is the spiritual side of uh, of Bitcoin? A lot of people also like talk about the spiritual awakening with Bitcoin. Yes. I mean, it's got so many dimensions. I mean, it's like, to some extent, a divine intervention. If you look at the world now, it is, it is war and there is turmoil. And the United States has done, I don't know what it is, 60 regime changes, you know, where they basically go in and bully and, and change a, a government around. That shouldn't be the case, you know. It, we should be living in a world where that's not the case and so that's also spiritual i believe and if you take the money printer away from these people they can no longer be the bullies and then it comes back to the sovereign you as an individual as a spiritual being or as a, as a you know an individual and you get to do good or you get to decide what you do with your toil uh, people don't take it away from you anymore you become honest you are honest because you're on an honest, the hardest standard ever to, to transact 
and that's what people do. That's what human beings are. You know, we live together in villages or towns or whatever. And so, like the cancer will be removed out of the system. And uh, yeah, to some extent, that is spiritual. I mean, I, I personally believe that we are spiritual beings having a earthly experience, and this plays. Uh, a role in it. We're now in the age of awakening, the age of Aquarius. We are now getting closer to ourselves again, back to nature, back to, you know, not materialistic things. And Bitcoin is, is crucial, I think, in that role. You know, people go from, you know, high time preference to low time preference. Uh, people take the time for good things, you know, it's all, if you now look at all the shit that comes out of China, you know, if you throw away a, a printer, you can buy a printer for 30 euros and then if it doesn't, you know, suit you, you, you chuck it away on the, on the, on the, in the, in the belt. So what's it called? The uh, waste the belt. That shouldn't be the case. I mean, you should be nice to have a printer that will last for 20 years or, you know, so, and all those incentives will come back to that. Because you're not running around on your treadmill like like an idiot and just trying to you know make do because inflation is stealing everything away, then inflation has stopped. It's become deflationary. Your time horizon, you know, it's a bit like you're going, you're looking down now, like you know, uh, pedaling like hell, and then you can look into the future, five years, ten years, one generation, two generations, three generations, knowing that your toil, your hard savings will always be there and probably more worth more than than what they are today. And your decisions, your investment decisions, your family decisions, they will all change for the better. So I think that's divine. And uh, yeah, that's spiritual. And uh, to some extent, uh, you know, it, 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 I think the time has come for uh, a Bitcoin for the people. Absolutely. I 100% agree with that. Um, we're already coming uh, closer to the one hour mark. Um before we come to the end routine, I want to get one thing out because I'm aware uh, we're entering a little bit of a bull market. And I think the ratio of new people uh, will slowly start in the Bitcoin podcast. So uh, I, I try to get also some beginner questions in. Um, uh, and with that is like, what is your most important Bitcoin lesson that you have learned as you are now? Uh, what is it 11 years uh, as you so told you since 2013 here what is the most important lesson uh in in bitcoin uh, for for someone that is maybe a little bit newer well that uh, maybe two things one that absolute scarcity has been created and i mean absolute scarcity nothing else in the world is scarce not your coastal property or your gold or your silver or, or anything else so that's unique and then the second thing is that it, it it brings back the power to the sovereign, to the person. And you could also say, you know, the division of money and state. So basically, you as an individual will now have 12 words in your head where you're basically your own central bank and you own your own IP, your own property, your own sovereignty, your own property rights. And nobody else can take that off you. So that's never happened before as well, you know, whether you cross borders or not. So that's putting the world upside down. You know, everything now is sort of centralistic, communistic, you know, power grab, power coming together. But now it's decentral, open source, uh, immutable, money for everyone, can never be stopped, can never be colluded, can never be taken away. And so every, for let's say the new podcasters, if, if there's something, it's, it's basically they get to own their own, you know, their property rights will be protected and they get to own their own money. It's, it's a bearer asset. It's nobody else's. You know, that's another important thing. It's, it's yours, no one else's. If you have those 12 words in your head, then forever and, and a day you will, uh, will own that. And that's never happened before. I think that's uh, that's really powerful. Also, it, it kind of has the chance that uh, it brings. I mean, there's this concept of like Bitcoin bringing abundance uh, to those. Do, do you subscribe to that? That that uh, Bitcoin is kind of ushering ab abundance. Yes, yes. You know, on LinkedIn on my profile, I've sort of given myself a name, and that name is creating abundance. So I, I guess everything I do is about abundance. 
And abundance is everything. It's not just abundance in wealth or in money, but abundance is uh, abundance in ideas, abundance in time, abundance in, uh, you know, sharing love, creating uh, stuff, you know, uh, and, and so Bitcoin is also a form of abundance. Um, and uh, yeah, we will see in the 10 or 20 years, one Bitcoin being worth $10 million. That's a form of uh, abundance, but also that it allows you to become a sovereign again and that your property rights are forever yours. That's abundance. So it's, it's, it's filled with abundance. So uh, yeah, <laughs> we really talk about cool. it for hours. <laughs> um uh, one question that i ask every one of my guests is uh what can we learn from you besides bitcoin well it's basically what we said i guess that um or the most powerful thing i think i could say is follow your passion and follow it as long as it is your passion and that will you know give you a fulfilled life It will also lead to abundance, whether you are interested in, in uh, working with the soil or you're interested in uh, creating ice cream or you're interested in uh, being an opera singer. If you follow your passion, uh, you will be uh, uh, excellent. You know, you will be exceptional. And that's maybe 5,000 years when the Bitcoin uh, has done its thing. Then we will transact in, in, in basically abundance or in, in value add. So if you're an opera singer, then basically that is what you do. That's your mission in life. And that's how you get fulfilled. And that's how you uh, transact. So, uh, yeah, that would be, I mean, it took me a long time to find out that that was a really important rule, but it, it works really well and it uh, gives you a fulfilling life. So that would be my, uh, my one-liner. One really, really cool. I love it a lot. Um, perfect. Then we come to an end routine where the a previous guest, a previous uh, guest asks a question for the next guest without knowing who the next guest uh, actually is. And your question from the previous guest is, how would you recommend buying Bitcoin for kids under the age of 18? It's an oddly specific question, but his, uh, his aim was because Uh, they cannot even pursue the KYC route because it's not allowed uh, in, in some countries or in most countries to buy stocks or Bitcoin under 18. Uh, and, and yeah, how would you do that? Well, by educating uh, the parents of the kids and then getting the parents to set aside a, uh, an account for the kids Uh, and buy some Bitcoin uh, on it. And then we come to another little topic that we didn't discuss today, but one of the eight wonders of the world by Albert Einstein, which is compound interest, you know, uh, interest on interest. And that's the biggest, biggest wonder in the world as well. So that fits uh, nicely with uh, cr uh, creating abundance. But if those parents would just save a few sat satoshis for, for their kids, and uh, leave it for 18 years. I mean, I think you've resolved a lot of the world's problems, you know, that would be a huge amount, uh, creating abundance uh, and uh, compound interest would, would, you know, even if it would be, let's say, 100 euros or call it 10 euros, and then the kids get to uh, use that 18 years from now, the 10 euros, it's more likely to be 100,000 or maybe a few million euros worth. So. Uh, That would be one way of doing it, I think. Uh, I love that answer a lot. Yeah, compound interest is something magical. Uh, it's, uh, it, it's if you get the power of that, you uh, you you really start uh, dealing with your money differently. <laughs> That's right. And don't know if we have time, but a, a metaphor works really well. And a, a great metaphor to explain it is, let's say, a snowball, right? So you start with, let's say, call it a hundred euro. That's your snowball. That's all your investment. So you take 100 euro. That's a snowball of a certain size. And then you need to think uh, of a, uh, a nice, gradually sloping snow. Uh, what's it called? Let's say going down a slope. You know, it's been snowing. And then you slowly roll the snowball down the hill. And all you paid for was the, the, the snowball itself, the 100 euros. But then the snow comes on the outside and it rolls around. But then the next time it rolls around, because the snowballs become bigger, you're getting all this free extra 
uh, snow and then it rolls around. And so if you have a long yard and it slopes down a couple of hundred meters and it's filled with nice wet snow and the gradient is uh, not too much. I mean, you could talk about the gradient being the interest rate and uh, the sun is not shining too much. And you could see the sun as inflation, which is melting the snow. You don't want that. So the sun, and then you start with this snowball and, and you roll it down and let's say it rolls for a hundred meters, then it will be as big as, as a car. So, but if you compare then the size of a car to something that is not much bigger than your hands, you've only paid for this. The rest is free and it's been created as a will, as a wonder, because it's, it's the interest on the interest on the interest on the interest that has created it. And the only reason why Warren Buffett is so rich and has, I don't know, 200 billion or something, probably 190 billion of that is due to that effect, the compound interest. The 10 other billion is due to him making a good decision, you know, not making too many mistakes. Uh, having a long time, he's got the 60, 70 years to compound. But but this wonder uh, is not explained at all in university. You've got to look it up yourself. But that's it's free and it's for everyone. So even the little kid who gets 100 euros, let's call it a snowball, 18 years later, he can possibly buy a house if he would have invested it in, uh, in Bitcoin or his parents would have. So And it's free and it's just... By using logic and using, uh, you know, spiritual laws and physical laws, and uh, it's for everyone. I love it a lot. Really, really cool. Uh, yeah, thank you so much also for your time. Um, before I let you go, where can people find you, ask you questions, reach out to you? Uh, maybe the easiest are on the website, www.amsterdamcapitalmanagement.com. And there's something also about our shares and other products that we, we have. Uh, so that's probably the easiest way uh, to, to get in touch. Perfect. Yeah. Thank you so much. Uh, also, thank you so much that it, uh, for everyone that is watching and listening for joining us today. As always, I'll be back tomorrow with another episode. Bye-bye.